the purpose of these one-on-one -on -one interviews with candidates is to get to know them more on a personal level. It's not so much a, a gotcha kind of interview, but a chance uh, to sit down with, in this case, Senator Mark Begich and talk about the campaign and some of the issues. And I warn you that there will be some hard questions, but <laughs> I, <you> expect know, <laughs> I want to start off with something fun because okay. I think we're all getting <laughs> election fatigue yeah. here. But I, I hear that you're a very good poker player, <laughs> or, or at least that's a passion of yours. And this must be, you know, with one of the most expensive elections in Alaska history, uh, a high stakes game for you. <laughs> high stakes all in. And uh, I like playing tournament charity poker. You know, I do it for charity groups, and uh, they're fun to do. It teaches you a lot of patience because you got to sit there and you know be calm and relaxed. Uh, but you get to know people, and uh, actually, I run into people all the time. I, I ran into someone just recently, and they said, "Oh yeah, we saw you at the Ferrandi poker tournament." So I run into these folks on a regular basis, and I think they're surprised when I show up there. And then they all want to get to the table that I'm at to beat me. <laughs> so, so this is a little bit high stakes, all in, and uh, but I feel very good where we're at. So, you know, compared to poker games, what's this like? I mean, are you <laughs> <laughs> you got cards hidden? What's um, the... You know, every day we're uh, you know working very hard to talk to voters. I'm out everywhere, as you can imagine, uh, making sure people know what the issues I care about, uh, what their issues are, and try to hear from people and then respond. I got an incredible ground game of folks talking and knocking on doors, probably more than people want, uh, but it's important. I think what Alaskans really enjoy, oddly enough, about politics is just one-on-one -on -one conversation. I do tele-town hall meetings where people, it's like a radio show in a way. I get online and thousands of people are online. They ask questions and, and they're wide ranging. And I think that's important. Well, let's go back to the poker game analogy. Sure. <laughs> what do you think your skill is when you play poker? Do you have a good, good poker face, or what's very your? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, share with us. Uh... Well, I, I think in, in in the campaign right now, you know, I, I I feel like we are doing everything possible. We got all the players at the table, and finally, as we move closer to the end of the campaign, as we get to November fourth. Um, people are going to start seeing the candidates as who they are, not how maybe these commercials have portrayed them in the sense of some of the negative attacks that I've felt all the way through the last two but years. But you've given your share. Yeah, as but well. I, I guarantee you, if you look at the ads, you know, when I started my campaign, I talked about my care, the program I did to help expand veterans' care across the state, the first place in the country to do this. I talked about the F 16s being stationed and kept in Fairbanks. I talked about the work we've done around education. I mean, I. We talk about the issues. Can and I just bring up one example, though, that has gotten you a lot of criticism about Jerry Active and a, a man who uh, committed a, a terrible crime, series of mm -hmm. crimes, and you sort of laid that on the lap of your opponent, Dan Sullivan. Well, the record of his plea bargains in many different cases was laid on the record. We never talked about that specific case. The next day, my opponent put the ad up with that individual's name. He had to pull his ad down. That was a fact. So at the end of the day, you can't run from your record, you know, plea bargains that he gave or the special, uh, in my view, uh, giveaway on the retirement system. I mean, Missouri got a better deal than we did on the same fraud case for our retirement PERS and TERS system. They got 40 cents on the dollar. Alaska got 20 cents, a $2 billion cost to the state. Uh, when you talk about his record around choice and women's issues, when you talk about his record on labor, I mean, I, you know, I think it's, it's important that we talk about the record. And but the Wall Street Journal praised that as a landmark court settlement. We're talking about well, the, the Mercer settlement. at 20 cents settlement. on the dollar when some of the Mercer group said they were guilty of fraud, of fraud. And the same thing in Missouri. We got 20 cents on the dollar, and out of a $500 million settlement, $100 million went to attorneys. I don't think it was a good deal. I think you need to push the case. I don't know why he was afraid to go to court when the opponents have already agreed that it was fraud. Now we're having to bail out the retirement system in order for it to survive and make sure the people who paid into it uh, that it's stable in the years to come. But I think it's important that we talk about the record of both of us. And I'm happy to talk about my record. And if you notice, he doesn't talk much about my record in the U.S. Senate, you know, getting the F-16s, making sure veterans' health care across the state is now offered to veterans or opening up the National Petroleum Reserve, making sure the Arctic moves forward, making sure mining permits happen in Bocan and Niblack and Greens Creek. I mean, I don't hear any of that debate, and I'm anxious for that. Well, he's got his own laundry list of, of accomplishments. I want to go back to the, the, the poker game. 
Uh, it would seem that your ace in the hole you're hoping is rural Alaska because you've put a lot of resources into campaigning out there. Do you think it can defeat the sheer gravity of, of Republican voters in our state, conservatives? Well, remember, Alaska, about 56% of the voters are non-registered to party. And that, that's a fact. We have elected Democrats and Republicans to statewide office off and on in the state and independents you recall Wally Hickel. So it varies from election to election. What I'm putting my faith in is not only rural Alaska, but Alaskans all across the state from Anchorage to Barrow and everywhere in between, and making sure that they understand and hear my voice out there and what I've been working on in Washington, D.C. And, and at the end of the day, they're going to make a decision, I believe, on who will represent Alaska in the United States Senate for the next six years. And one of the things that you know, I want to ask you about is, of course, your relationship with Lisa Murkowski, Senator mm -hmm. Murkowski. She's kind of t turned a cold shoulder to you this campaign. Well, how, if, you, if you get reelected, how is that going to work? I, I have no problem. I, I mean, I've worked with people on both sides of the aisle. I continue to do. In the last year here, Lisa and I have voted 80 percent of the time on every single uh, issue that's come in front of the Senate. And over the lifetime of my career, almost 65%, we have the highest percentage of voting together than any other split delegation in the whole United States Senate. If most people would act like this, we'd get a lot more done. I don't take what she's doing personally because I recognize she's being asked by the National Party to, to weigh in. You know, I'm going to focus on what I think is right for Alaska. At the end of the day, you know, elections are over. Uh, when I win, I'll be happy to work with her. Now, I have heard this from your staffers going back to the time when you were mayor, um, that one of your character traits is, is to not hold a grudge. That's right. I, I just don't believe it. I think it's it's a waste of time. Where did that philosophy <laughs> begin? What taught you? Uh, probably indirectly and directly, obviously, from my mother and father and just kind of how I am. I just don't think, you know, people who sit there and have a personal view all the time on someone rather than working with them, I think that it gets them nowhere. When I was, remember when I was on the Anchorage Assembly, Tom Fink was the mayor. And everyone measured their time of how many vetoes they had by him, you know, 60, 50, when they were chairman. Not me, I had less than six. And it's because I sat down with Tom Fink every single week. And elections are elections. I get there's other issues going on uh, with Senator Murkowski right now. But at the end of the day, we've got to work together for Alaska's interests. So I don't, I, I don't hold a grudge. I just move now, on. You've been in the public scene, you know, since you were a young man working mm -hmm. for, for Tony Knowles and his office when, when he was mayor. So we're, we've been around you. Um, <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, you know, we've seen your ups and downs. Sure. We've seen you lose elections. Uh -huh. We've seen you win elections. But I, I would like to ask you this, because we may not know this, is, is in your life, what is, was the most difficult thing that you encountered, the, the most uh, challenging thing you ever had happen to you, and then how w did you deal with it? Well, that's a great question. I think there's lots of things in my life that have been uh, hard. I mean, defining? But what's defining? Well, I don't know if there's, I think accumulation or defining. I mean, I think one point at, at one stage in my life when I was uh, my mother and was having a hard time financially, and I remember because it was the crash of the 80s, the apartment business was not the most fun business to be in, real estate crashes, banks were closing. And I remember uh, at one point my mom had to move back into the apartment that I was raised in. And at one point I, you know, we were over cleaning apartments uh, to make sure they were prepared for the next tenant. And I thought to myself at that age, I said, there's no way I'm going to let her do this again. And so I worked double time to do everything I could to change the way that environment worked. Did everything I could to make those apartments better and make sure she could retire quicker. Because I, I just, when I saw that, after my mother had raised six kids, gone through enormous um, stress in her life, uh, you know, her husband dying, my dad dying. And um, let's talk a little bit about that. I'm surprised that you didn't bring that up as, as the first defining moment. Uh, I was 10. So it's, you know, when <laughs> your you look, father, yeah. uh, who was a congressman, mm -hmm. Nick Bagich, died in a plane crash, mm -hmm. and also uh, another uh, prominent congressman, Hale Boggs, right. died in that crash. You know, and, and I have to ask you this, I've always wondered this, is, you know, they've never found the wreckage. Right. Right. I mean, do you ever think about, at the point that they do, what, how you'll respond to that? Um, it's a tough one. I mean, I, you know, you asked the question about defining moments, you know, when I was 10, and later as time progressed, at 10 years old, you're a lot of emotions. And I remember certain things and aspects of that moment in my life. As time has progressed, and a lot of people come to me and tell me stories, 
about my dad. It doesn't matter where I travel, there's some story. But then there's always someone who might come up to me and said, you know, I had someone just very recently, I think it was in Sitka, if I remember right, uh, came to me and showed me a map and said, well, this is where I think the plane went down. I mean, just recently, in the last few months. And so I get that input from people all the time. And, you know, some people are just so passionate and uh, knew my dad uh, very personal and are, are, you know, excited to see me. I have had people come up to me and give me hugs and start crying because they want to explain their experiences. Their connection Their to connection, your or like a gentleman told me, your dad, matter of fact, at AFN uh, recently, I, they, uh, an individual came to me and told me how my dad slept on their floor uh, in their house. And so, you know, I, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle that have impacted me from my, you know, dad's disappearance to my mom and watching her have to relive what she had already worked her heart out to, to raise six kids to a variety of other things in my family. And all that helps me understand as a person how to deal and work out problems that I have. And, and also I've, I've learned, I really believe this, my philosophy is if I wake up breathing, that's a really good day. If I wake up breathing and my son and wife are there, it's fantastic. Everything else in life you can solve, you can work out, you can deal with. But I try not to take it all personal. I, I've done my best. When people criticize me, and they, there's plenty of it, not only on TV, on radio, or newspapers. I just, you know, that's more about the people who are making the criticism. And I just need to keep focused on what I need to do and move forward. Well, one of the things that people probably don't know is that, that you were a landlord. You had, right. had that landlord episode of in your life. That's uh, right. And that it teaches you, you a lot of experiences, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> and that, that you were sort of a tinkerer, fixing uh, yeah. leaky Everything. drains. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a tinker. I'd say it's a full-on repair. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's stories. I, I, I have people come back from door to door, and they say, did you know something? such and such, and I said, well, that name sounds very familiar. He said, yeah, they said when you were mayor, they called you about a leak in the toilet, and you came over and fixed it, and you were wearing your suit, and you had to take off your jacket. I mean, I hear these stories all the time, and I, it, it taught you a lot, right? And also, as you're working on repairs in an apartment, when I was on the assembly, or even when I was mayor, people would tell me, you know, their views in life and what they're concerned about. Uh, but it also taught you to work with your hands and know that it, it was almost like therapy in a way because, you know, you worked on big policy, but then you went and you painted out a unit or you ripped up carpet. Well, I want to ask you about that is, is, I mean, when you look at your approach to policy, um, your approach in, in, in the Senate, is there a bit of a, a tinkerer in you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, it's great to talk about stuff on the 30,000 level. And give you an example, when we dealt with this issue around veterans care in the state, I mean, it was a big problem. People were saying, you know, veterans from far off uh, parts of Alaska had to fly to Anchorage or fly to Seattle to get care. The simple solution would have been to just say, well, here's a piece of legislation, just pass it and hope it all works. I get into the details. I want to know how it's going to work, what the functions will be to make sure that when that person walks through that door in Nome, Alaska, what is the service they're going to get and how does the VA pay for that and all that. It drives my staff a little crazy, but I think it helps me understand the legislation that I'm working on, but also how it's going to work. Because legislative bodies spend a lot of time talking to talk. Administrative has to actually administer it. And I want to know how it's going to deliver the services. And now we have services all across the state. Well, so I, I tweak things a lot. And you I, know, you bring up rural Alaska, one mm -hmm. instance of some of the work you've done there. Uh, it, Senator Stevens was really probably the single most important person to rural Alaska, more so maybe mm -hmm. than the governor mm -hmm. or state lawmakers because of the amount of federal money he brought in, the Denali Commission, uh, the, the fuel tanks that were built in his right. day, the health clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that, that your opponent, based on what you've seen on the campaign, you feel that that he has the grasp of, of these kind of things. I know he's been campaigning sort of as someone who would take up Ted Stevens' legacy. Well, first challenge he's going to have is he won't be on the Appropriations Committee because there's no history in this country that ever allows two from the same party, from the same state, to be on appropriations. We're very fortunate right now. We have two U.S. Senators on the Appropriations Committee you know, incredible clout. Both sides of the aisle are covered. So he can't get to that piece of the equation ever because it's never been done. But put that aside for a second. I think there is a, a big difference uh, of his understanding of rural Alaska. I mean, we see it when we had a fish debate recently and the lack of knowledge on some of those issues. But even that, I think when you're thinking about Alaska issues, I will challenge people who are watching this show, go to our websites, look at our policy statements and what we are proposing. 
His are grand sweeping conversations. Mine are grand sweeping with detail because it's important that voters know if you say you're going to do X, what will that mean? And I think he has not been able to do that and articulate uh, how he's going to make things happen. I, I, I get a lot of time when he talks about Obama and he talks about my mayor's record, but the real issue that Alaskans, that I hear from Alaskans, every time I do a town hall meeting, they want to know, okay, great, Mark, you did that. Now, what are you going to do the next six years? And we've articulated that in great detail on our website, and, and I would challenge people who are watching the show to, you know, that simple task of going to the website, it would be like looking for Waldo to find statements about fisheries on his website. It'd be the same thing on education. I can go through the list. Well, you know, there's been plenty of time devoted to that in numerous debates and things, but... Well, actually, not very many debates. Well, <laughs> so. you, know, you know, compared to other states, actually, you know, Alaska has had a surprising number of debates. But and, that's and a, that, that is what we do as Alaskans. I can tell you time and time again how many debates that I do in every election, because Alaskans demand it. That's what we do. We're not like the rest of the low 48. Well, one of the things that has been a thread in, in the campaign, and it's almost annoying, uh, to people who are getting very tired of the the back and forth in this is there's almost this I'm a more Alaskan than thou well I think you know there there's two pieces of this one is I think who you are is important about what you'll do in Washington DC you know you described it uh, in your questions earlier and that is you know being born and raised here had a lot of history ups and downs in Alaska I've been a small business owner been on the Anchorage Assembly been mayor of Anchorage running the city uh, now been in the U.S. Senate. All that defines who you are as a person. So when you go serve, people have a better understanding of where you'll come from. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree either. It means that a person can look at you and say, okay, I know he has these varied experiences. And when, you know, my opponent loves to say I'm a career politician, I've been in politics and public service, but I've also been a small business owner. Let's you know, talk a little are... bit about a, being a career politician is that a badge of honor or is that well, I, I think serving <laughs> in public service is an incredible honor to serve your community and it doesn't you know but I take all my experiences you know if you ask me right now about the apartment business I can tell you exactly what's going on in our apartments today about the work we're doing in replacing some windows but at the same time if you ask me about the student loans and what we're doing in the United States Senate to make it better and easier for kids to afford college I can also tell you that I think all that is important to round a, a person as they move forward into public service. I believe in public service. You know, if it's if I'm not, as you know, I've lost some races. That didn't stop me from serving my community. I kept active, you know, Boys and Girls Club, Mountain View, many other things that I kept active in giving back to a community that's well, done well for me. Dan Sullivan has almost the perfect resume for a senator. I mean, he's been to Harvard. Uh, he, he's worked under a presidential administration, highly placed in, in the State Department. Uh, he's served in the military. So, so he's got a wonderful resume and, and background. And you know, I think you know, some, of, some of the folks on his side have said, well, Mark doesn't even have a college education. Yeah, you know, I went to School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> and so let me, let me say this. I think the voters decide what's the right resume. I mean, having it on paper is one thing. Actions speak louder than words. You know, I look at my record of accomplishments when I was mayor, building more roads than the last three mayors combined, building two new middle schools, increasing public safety, solving a problem that everyone said couldn't be done, built a convention center, museum. I get things done, and that's the resume that I bring to the table. When I'm in the U.S. Senate, making sure traditional foods are taken care of, veterans care, F-16s, permits for mines, opening up National Petroleum Reserve, which had never been open for development before I came along. So I like to talk about the record of what I'm doing. And on top of that, you know, remember I chaired the Post-Secondary Education Commission for seven years, Student Loan Corporation for this state for seven years, turned it around from bankruptcy to a very profitable organization that lowered interest rates for kids. So I'll stand on my record against anyone who has a lot of paper, because uh, it is important. Actions speak a lot louder than words. Well, let's talk a little bit about what happens if, if you're elected. And let's just suppose that uh, the, the GOP takes over the Senate. Mm -hmm. so, so then you're in the minority. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as despite what my opponent likes to say as one of the most moderate uh, senators in the U.S. Senate, and that's based on uh, PolitiFact and others who have done analysis on this, 
Um, a moderate senator, a moderate Democrat, is very important to how you get the 60 votes in the United States Senate. Because even if the Republicans take over the Senate, they will not have 60 votes. They will never get the 60 without people like myself who are moderate, who are pro-gun, pro-oil and gas development, will push against the president when necessary, will fight for cutting the budget when I believe it's right. Sitting on appropriations, I'll still be on the Appropriations Committee. I'll still be on the Commerce Committee. I'll be ranking member of the Fisheries and Coast Guard Committee under that scenario. I'll still be the ranking member under FEMA and Emergency Management Committee under Homeland Security. I'll still be on the Veterans Committee, still be on the Indian Affairs Committee. And even though the president will be gone in two years, and that's the fact, everyone kind of forgets that, this is a six-year Senate seat, uh, you're going to still have to have someone who can pick up that phone and yell at the president when necessary for the benefit of Alaska. And the Republicans aren't going to be able to do that. Well, I guess there's a lot of unknowns out there, and, and Alaskans are going to have to weigh the pros and cons of perhaps uh, having a, a, a GOP Senate and Lisa Murkowski chair of the Energy Committee. Mm -hmm. and, and what a plum that would be for Alaska. Yeah, here, here's the, no dis disagreement that's a, a value in a certain way, but at the same time, what's more important in my view in Alaska is I'll, I'll remind the Appropriations Committee, which is the holy grail to Alaska. That brings resources back here. When I got on the uh, Appropriations Committee, the year before I got on, 16, 17 million in construction for military. The year after I got on, 200 million. Democrat and Republican on there, covering both sides, so it doesn't matter who's in the minority or majority. As we found with Senator Stevens and Senator Inouye, they worked together, Democrat and Republican. That was a value there, here's a value now. It is very clear, the history speaks to it. That there'll never be a time so that you'll have two Republicans from the same state on appropriations committee. They don't allow it. So who's your buddy on the other side of the fence? Dep your, your comparable NOA <laughs> Stevens. Well, it depends. On. You know, I, I work with a lot of Republicans, and it just depends on the issue. Like right now, I'm working with Senator Vitter on a bill on duck stamps. I just finished a bill with Senator in or with Senator Inhofe regarding pilot safety. I work with. Uh, variety, Senator Ayotte, we did many things on uh, mental health services, improving mental health services to our military and veterans. So I, I work with all of them. I mean, I, I, my view is all of them have their different views. Rand Paul and I are on a bill regarding uh, auditing the feds. Uh, so I, I look for whoever has interest in Alaska issues. And if they do, I'm going to work with them. And I don't care their personalities. I love sitting down with these folks, having their conversation. They're all, everyone comes in the U.S. Senate, 100 people, 100 different personalities and different stories of where they've come from um, and what they're about. And I enjoy working with them. Senator Shelby, who's uh, on the on appropriations, uh, always enjoy uh, having conversations with him about things he's working on. He always talks about his son. Uh, and so I, I, I'll sit with anyone and talk with them and, and build friendships as necessary, but I just really enjoy these different personalities, and it's intriguing to me. I want to spend a little bit of time on rural Alaska and tribal mm -hmm. issues. Now, one of the things that we've seen as a result of these King Salmon crises on both the Yukon mm -hmm. and Kuskokwim is this real desire for tribal co-management. Yes. And, and this year we saw, actually, on the Kuskokwim, the feds take over management of a portion of the river for right. subsistence. What, what's your take on that? Well, as you know, I'm a big supporter of subsistence rights. I think it's important, an inherent right that Alaska Native people have. I think that's important to recognize it. I wish our state constitution would do that. That's been a 20, 30 year battle. Uh, we've seen success in some ways, like the Welling Commission, which has worked to manage uh, an important resource for uh, folks up in the northern region. Uh, and I'm not opposed to sitting down and figuring out how to manage this if it's a co-management. Uh, but I can tell you the state uh, most recently, I'm trying to remember the exact case, but I remember they closed the fisheries, then they opened the fisheries uh, and allowed commercial, but they did not allow subsistence, and there was a big problem because at the end of the day, the subsistence users need it, need it on their plate for survival. It's not a go down to the grocery store and buy food. And I think when we think of these issues, it's we have to look at the region and figure out how to work it out together. I can tell you as chair of the Fisheries and Coast Guard Committee, we're working on the Magnus and Stevens Act reauthorization. We're incorporating more conversation about uh, subsistence uh, because I think it's important that we look at fisheries not just from the commercial end, but subsistence in sports, this overall picture of fisheries management. And it does mean we have to recognize it. And when there's situations like we've seen, uh, we have to recognize that the first people of the land need to have food on their table. Food security. Food security. I mean, otherwise you're, you know, it's one thing to sell and buy fish, but when you are living off of it, 
it's a priority. We need to figure this out. And it means that there's a cooperation, and some, as you know, in the Native community are not very happy with um, uh, the way the state has managed some of the fisheries. And so they're looking for better management tools, and I'm anxious to work with them. Well, let's talk a little bit about the sexual assault issues that, that rural Alaska faces, mm -hmm. domestic violence. Uh, some people have said that, you know, if you could solve some of the subsistence anxieties, that that, that might go a long ways towards helping the social problems. Do you agree? I think that's just a very small piece. I think you have substance abuse within the communities. You have long history of situations that have occurred. You have lack of, in my view, uh, ownership within the community. That's why the Safe Families and Village Act that I've proposed, which the state opposes, my opponent opposes, would give power to villages and civil court process to take ownership. And I think this is important. We, we have tried this kind of top down, let the state government always solve this. What we need to do is turn to the communities and say, what will work best? A wellness court, elder court, elder and youth court, community court, tribal court? Let's figure this out so we're doing something better to get folks on the right track. But on top of that, we have huge issues of getting young people to understand. Last year at AFN, you might remember those young people that came forward and spoke at AFN. I mean, just gripping. From the Tanana, Tanana area. 4 H group. That's right, gripping. And that had, ne in the history I've been around AFN, I'd never seen that kind of public exposure of this issue by young people. And I think that was somewhat an awakening in a way for the next generation to say, we're not going to tolerate this any longer. But it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take resources. It's going to take ownership within the community. And I think our role is create some tools that allow that. And well, one of the things, you know, we, we talk about sexual assault, domestic violence, mm -hmm. uh, in, in rural areas, and, and we're not expecting to hear about it in, in the National Guard among some of the, right. the, the top brass. That's right. What's this, your take on, on, on the current National Guard scandal that we have in Alaska? I know that your office uh, heard about this early. Mm -hmm. Well, we heard about it in 2011 and 2012, and we pushed the envelope pretty hard, and we got the Guard Bureau, which is the federal agency, to come in, but they're limited. And this is a problem we found, that only the governor can request the Guard Bureau. This is the National Guard Bureau. And remember, we federal government funds a lot of the National Guard, and we have a lot of significant roles in, in, its, in, its, in what they do. But the governor is the ultimate commander-in-chief of the Guard. So the Guard Bureau is very limited, which I was surprised that they could not go in there and you know, interview Guard members independently of the governor's approval. And I propose legislation to fix this, recognizing we have a state guard that needs to be a state guard, but recognizing the Guard Bureau's job is not to protect the governor, it's to protect the people who work within and maybe are being abused so, or, fall, you know. So how did, how did your uh, office... How did we find out about yeah, how it? How did you, and when? We, yeah, we had members coming uh, in 2011 in, in that period of time, and they were coming... A couple of people came, and you know, when you hear a couple, you might think it's just someone getting fired or some employee, but then we kept hearing several, and that told us there's something bigger here, something that's underneath the surface. So what did you do? Well, we asked the guard bureau to go in and do an investigation, and it was pretty limited because they were limited in what they could do, and that started to lay out, I think, the foundation of where we're at today. So I, what I happened say, with that investigation? Well, that's, um, you know, what the governor did with that, you're going to have to ask him. Um, you know, I know what we were able to give them for them to take action. Most of ours was focused on fraud and abuse. There was a little bit uh, we started to hear on sexual harassment, but that had not come to the surface as much. And I think it was because a lot of people, as you know, the latest survey they did within the Guard Bureau said 35% of the people were afraid to even speak out. So I think what we saw was there was some situation occurring here. I can tell you, you know, and I understand the governor's comment was, well, I didn't have enough information. Well, go get it. Go get it. That's when I was mayor and we had any incident like this that could have percolated, we got our municipal attorney out there, or I asked my municipal attorney to go get an independent, maybe a former judge or a retired judge, to go and do some investigation. Why? Because we may not get all the information, but an independent person surely would. Now, we haven't heard very much about... Uh, Dan Sullivan's role in this because it's on some of his tour of duty as as an uh, attorney general, attorney general yeah. was when the scandal was brewing. Right now he may not have been there long enough to to be very involved in this. But mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think it's a good good question for him. But even 
let's let's assume for a moment that he may not have an answer for when he was there, but during this time, I haven't heard a a word about. I mean, I've spoke out on this during this whole incident that's been unraveling. I haven't heard a word. He's been very silent on this issue. And you know, the, the question I would always have is, well, do you is the governor handling this right, or is he not handling it right? I, I have my criticism. You've seen him on news. <laughs> I've, I've said it, and I think. Being silent or during that time when he was attorney general, it begs the question, you know, what was your role? What did you do? What did you didn't do? And why didn't you know? Or did you know? And then further down the road, really, here we are in the middle of campaign. We had two major issues this year when you think about sexual assault. Sexual assault in the military, as you know, we had several pieces of legislation we worked on to get that out of the command structure. Never heard a word from Dan Sullivan on that. And now we're in this Alaska, very Alaska-centric under the guard, not a word. I, I've spoken out on this because I think it's appalling, both in our military when there's sexual assault and all at the same time with the National Guard. These are things that Alaskans, when almost every town hall meeting or teletown hall meeting, what I call uh, unannounced town halls, that's my show up at a grocery store or something, and people are talking to me, this issue percolates. And they know what I have said and what I've talked about and what we're doing to work to fix this problem. But not yet have I heard my opponent or any of my opponents speak on this issue. Well, to wrap things up here, you know, somebody has to win, somebody has to lose, and you could be the one that will lose come November. So well, what So what will you do after that, it, should that happen? Well, I'm not planning to lose. All right, you're not uh, planning, I, Yeah, but, so I'm but, working hard to win, and I'm out there every day uh, earning votes and talking to people and making sure they know the message of how important this race is. And I know there's some angst that people have toward Obama, but, you know, he's gone in two years. This is about a six-year seat for the United States Senate to represent Alaska, fighting for the issues we care about, maybe oil and gas development, fighting for our veterans, improving education, making the quality of life better here, improving, investing in infrastructure. That's what this race is about. But, but saying that to your question, you know, I never think in the negative. Maybe you do. I don't. You know, I don't think of what could happen. I think about what's possible. And what's possible is I will win this race. Now, if the worst case scenario happens, I'll still be involved in my community. I love this state. I will still be active. I will be a public servant in many ways, maybe serving on boards or serving in our community, but I will not abandon this community. I will not abandon this state. Anytime I've lost, I've lost two mayor's races. My voice was still out there. My activism of helping to make the community a better place will still be there, but I don't plan to lose. I'm gonna work hard all the way to the end. It will be close. But All right, well, we'll race. check in with you, I'm sure, on election night. But, Thank but thanks very much, Thank Senator you. Mark Bagich, for joining us.